So there's a misconception that if you're single, you are incomplete, perhaps damaged, salvaged, and you won't be happy until you find your one. And that is not true. That is bullshit. It is a message that has been fed to us by media and advertising. The truth is, when you're single, you have the richest soil for growth. That's why I created this podcast. And unlike other podcasts, this one is host-driven, not guest-driven. That means I will be rotating health and wellness experts three times a week to give you the giant box of wellness crayons, not just the primary colors, so you can start building a meaningful life. It's time to give singlehood a cape. Hi, MC. Hi, Paul. How are you? We... I'm great. Um, and we are back. And we are back. To follow up on disclosing trauma in new relationships. Part um, two. Part two. Uh, MC, you reached out to me and you felt that we left a lot on the table. And um, I agree. This is a mm-hmm. heady topic and one that deserves um, a bit more discussion, driven by you, um, who, for people who do not know, is a PhD researcher in trauma coach and uh, author. Yeah. And I, I am Paul Chamberlain, known as the smart, funny, tortured coach who has seen his fair share of trauma and been through relationships, identifies as bisexual, and uh, is enjoying a really good part of life now that some of these things are behind me. And God, I wish these conversations existed when I was single and dating. So MC, what pops up? Um, what comes to mind that we immediately need to address, um, or share with people? Well, so I think if you have, if you're listening and you haven't listened to our first podcast, go back and do that because we kind of lay the groundwork for trauma and relationships, why it's important to disclose and also negotiation in, in, in this space. But um, I think we spent so much time, necessary time, um, laying that groundwork that we didn't really get into the specifics. And so I thought we might go through, you know, three different points at which you might need to or want to disclose trauma in a relationship and what that can look like. So we could do like when you have to disclose in the very beginning, which we talked about a little bit on the, on part one, um, and then in the middle, and then what about if it's a, you know, long-term relationship and something is coming up. So just to give people lots of tools and understanding of yeah how this can look at different points in relationship. Yeah, I think that's great to go in chronological order um, because we did touch on date two or three when you do have to disclose stuff. And then also the, competitive or comparative aspect when you both, um, possess, uh, trauma. So, um, early in a relationship, early in a relationship. So some of this will be review, right? But if you want to disclose something like, let's, let's get an example. What, and this is actually interesting because when I was thinking of these examples, I could think of 22 examples for middle of a relationship and then long-term relationship when something pops up. But in the beginning of the relationship, I was really struggling. What do you think would be a good example for us to work with of something you'd need to disclose on date two? We talked about kind of personal experiences last time, but if we can think yeah, of like a more... Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is obviously something within the sexual realm. Um, yeah. Whether it's disclosing identity or mm-hmm. past, past experience of which you were a victim. Mm -hmm. Um, and that you, you feel that you're straying into an area that could dismantle, disrupt, or destroy what you got going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's get specific, right? You're on date three. You think this is going to go somewhere sexual Mm -hmm. and you've got something you need to say before you move from dinner to the bedroom. Yeah. Um, Okay. I think the first thing is to plan a script. Not that you're going to plan the entire thing because you've got another person in the conversation, but I think having a really solid understanding of what you want to say and what you don't want to say is really helpful ahead of time. So, because I think one of the things that happens with people who are survivors of trauma is that um, it's very tempting to over explain. 
And it's hard to remember that the person that you're on this date with, because it feels very important and precarious, it's only day three. So in all likelihood, like, you know, this person a little bit, but not super well. Do you want to go into your entire backstory? Right. No. And, and you're falling into this intimacy this like, oh, there's this is somebody that can hold space for me. This is great. This is wonderful. Right. You know, thirst, thirsty person drinking kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah. And, and like you said, you don't know that this person's going to be able to necessarily do that. And you could, you know, this could really get in the way of the thing you've been building. So I think this happens particularly. So you brought up the example of like, let's say you, you've, you're a survivor of sexual assault. Um, you don't have to go into detail. You don't have to share anything you're not comfortable sharing. You can if you want to, right? But I think it's really important to, for victims of trauma to have autonomy in this space of dating and to not feel like they have to give over their entire history to someone. Like, so let's say you had an abusive relationship, right? And um, you had sexual violence in that relationship. You don't need to go into, again, unless you want to, how that relationship started, where your shame is when it comes to staying in that relationship, if that is a thing, right? Mm -hmm. You can just say, you know, I'm, I'm someone for whom relationship violence has been a thing. And here are my parameters. That's it. That's it. You know, what happened in my experience before is that my disclosure caused their disclosure. Oh, interesting. Okay. Or their disclosure yep. pushed me to go, okay, um, since we're sharing, I'm by. I've had experiences with men. And then it, it, then it literally created, you know, everybody went back to their respective corners um, for a couple of weeks and processed and then came back oh, together. Like freaked out. Was, so you didn't have the of, experience of like, Oh, this is, we both no, Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There was no high fives over the table. It was like, <laughs> eek. Yeah. Um, yeah. so is, is, are you often prepared to, I have just disclosed this wow, I'm so glad you're bringing this out in the open because this happened to me. And then it's like, oh, be careful what you wished for. Shit, I'm on the other side now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think like, I'm so glad you're bringing this up because that's kind of, I didn't have that specific idea in mind. But when when I said a minute ago to, to plan a script, make sure that you include the fact that there's a, there's a question mark in that script, mm -hmm. right? So know the things you want to say, but also be open to the fact that things are going to come back. And that I was thinking like, you know, judgment or questions you might not be ready to answer. Um, things like that. But um, it could very well be, I have this other thing that I want to disclose. Um, and <laughs> Oh my God, you that, too? Wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me tell you, and that can easily go into what we were talking about last time with the like competitiveness, right? I can yeah. see that going to a place of like, oh, well, okay. So you had sexual assault, you know, as an adult, I had childhood sexual assault. And so you know, now we're talking about my needs and that's, that I think could be instead of validating, instead of like a place we could come together and say, oh, wow, you know, number one, this stuff is really common. Number two, we both have the shared experience that we can maybe deepen our bond over. It could become corrosive. Yeah. Is there a, is there a next step is like, not, not to say that hey, it's our third date. Maybe the two of us should like sit down with a third party or something like right. that. But is there, is there, is there a third element? Is there an external element or factor that can be introduced to ameliorate the situation mm -hmm. and not, not just leave it up to these two people that wrangle with themselves? That's a great question. I, I, I wish that there was something that came to mind, right? Like a, a common shared resource that people could go to and say like, okay, let's get, you know, let's get some support here. But I don't, other than like, if you have friends and people in your life who know your story and are able to hold space for you, you could go to them as a potential couple, right? You could do this as sort of a group conversation, but that's going to be a pretty rare group of friends, you know? Yeah. I mean, I remember back in the day when you would date somebody and it was I mean, in college. Okay. And then now we'll take a trip, a joint trip to the clinic for testing. Right. And, right. and that was a bonding experience, right. you know, <laughs> totally. a an outward show of trust kind of thing. Yeah. It doesn't seem like mm -hmm. there is anything that exists in this realm. 
No. And, and I think like the kind of the elephant in the room that we're sort of like talking around without meaning to talk around it is this idea that, that sometimes it's the first date and you're there for sex. Right. And so, you know, what can you disclose comfortably? What can you receive comfortably from someone else that would enable you to continue that date as you planned? Yeah. Cause we're kind of talking about like dating as if all dates become relationships and you're building something and whatever. But it's like, if you are someone who has had violence or you have a, a sexual identity or you have an STI that you need to disclose and you are in this place of, okay, I need this person to know this before we have this encounter, but I don't necessarily want this to become like a therapeutic session, right? Yeah. What, how, what are the parameters there? And I think that like, no one talks about that. Yeah. I, I'm seeing more and more in um, certain platforms like field um, mm -hmm, where people mm -hmm. are disclosing, like, I mean, it is, it is an environment specifically for alternative. We say alternative and that's not a fair term, but it's a, like complete honesty and complete disclosure, kinks, predilections, mm -hmm. wants, mm -hmm. desires. And then also, this is my, you know, this is my status. This is, and that's mm -hmm. something that also pops up in, you know, the same sex stuff too, is like, right. I mean, now it's, it's hilarious. You've got, you know, vaxxed and boosted monkey pox <laughs> on prep. Yeah. I mean, it's, right. it's ridiculous, but it's right. full disclosure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also, and, po you know, also positive, negative, um, right. you know, statuses as well. Right and whether people are poly and they're currently sleeping with other people. And what, you know, do you think that that, that in that space, people are more able and willing to both like disclose and receive someone else's disclosure because these things are already like listed on the app? A hundred percent. I mean, because yeah. the, the app, they are literally pull down options. And so when it's mm -hmm. brought down to that, mundane level of just mm -hmm. checking a box of, you know, I'm, I'm five, seven, you know, this and, you know, brown hair. And, th and then it's like, oh, and I'm vaxxed or I'm on prep or I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I have herpes. Okay. There right. it is. It's out there. And, yeah. and then there's a comfort on that side too, is that like any replies you get, mm -hmm. it's all out on the table. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think is going all the way back down to tr traditional dating where it's yeah. comfort, where you don't, where you're s mining for data instead of already right. having it prior. Right, 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 right. And it's interesting yeah. to see how this changes generationally. Cause I think, I can't remember if we were talking about this on the podcast last time, but, um, my, I teach college. And so my students are like, they, you know, day one, they come into class and it's like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a sophomore and I have developmental trauma and panic disorder right, right in front of yeah. class, you know? And so I wonder if, you know, some of this is, is revealing our age because to us disclosing any kind of mental health status, even in the early months of a relationship would be pretty scary, let alone on the third date saying, you know, I can't, you can't put your hands on my neck because I've got a previous experience with, you know, sexual assault. The, the vanguard and the person holding the lantern in front of me when I came out mm -hmm. at the, you know, at my age was my, was my 14 year old daughter. Yeah. And it was on coming know, out exactly. day and I told her and she just shrugged her shoulders. She's like, I know, you know, she's like, <laughs> <laughs> she's like okay. All right. I'm like, all right, moving on. Guess, guess was that that's anticlimactic. Oh, it was, I mean, everything about coming out at this age in, in 2022 has been anticlimactic because you build it up, build it up, build it up and nobody, your whole life. Yeah. through your whole life and nobody gives a shit. Mm -hmm. And then you mm -hmm. find out the other thing on the flip side is that, oh, it's not a scarlet letter. It's actually a, <laughs> in somebody may find it attractive. Somebody may find it, yeah. you know, hot, I'm like, wait, what, right. you know? Right. So yeah, the, the changing mores and, um, the levels of communication are abundantly refreshing right now. And that is really reflected. I know a lot of people just crap on dating apps and things like that, but these ones that are essentially dedicated to 
hooking up and dating honestly, mm-hmm. it's the, the dialogues within them are nothing but healthy. Yeah. Cause everything's out yeah. in the open. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because we've just sort of kind of stumbled upon this idea that there's this huge spectrum of responses. So if we go back to the date and you're at the table and you've got something to disclose, whatever that is, maybe you've yeah. had, um, you know, the trauma of the experience and then also the trauma of other people's bad responses. Yeah. And so you're sitting at the table and we've got this huge spectrum of responses where on the yeah. one hand, someone could kind of say, could dismiss you. Right. Yeah. Which is, I think, where our fear minds go to first and say, well, I can't possibly. Yeah, that's too much. You're too much. There's something wrong with you. But on the other hand, it could be almost dismissed in, in the opposite direction. Right. Yeah. <laughs> which I think points to the idea that like your intention in that conversation has to be clear and not tied to the other person's response because their response doesn't say anything about you. It says everything about them which is so easy to say and so hard to remember in these tender moments. But yeah. if your intention in that conversation is simply to be honest and disclose to your level of comfort, then you have checked all of your you know, mental health boxes. What they respond with is always going to be a question mark and it could fall anywhere on that spectrum. You talked about the brevity of introducing it. And, mm-hmm. and being on the, on the low volume end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. how would you introduce, I mean, if you were doing it on an app or in a conversation, what is the language you use? Like I'm a survivor or mm-hmm. I've been a victim of trauma. How do you just <laughs> write it down on a cocktail napkin and slide it across the table and go, it's, I'm just leaving it in two or three words. And if you want to yeah. talk about it more, I'm great. What are yeah, those? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And this is going to be, I think, an unsatisfying answer, but I think it's, you have to choose the language that fits you and your experience. And so some people really resonate with the terminology around survival. Um, Mm -hmm. other people really resonate with the terminology around being a victim and there's nothing, there's a, there's a totally valid argument on either side. Um, and so I've seen people disclose kind of in a humorous way because they feel like that um, that's like an empowered stance to take. Um, and I think that can be very powerful, but I wouldn't recommend that to everybody because if that doesn't feel empowering to you, then it's, that's not going to be empowering. Um, so I would, I would sit down and again, like think about two things. What are your intentions here, whether you're disclosing on an app or in, in person, um, or in a phone call or whatever. And two, what language do you feel like fits your experience? It's so tempting to kind of reach for language that other people use, but like check with yourself. Do you feel like the word survivor is, is not, you know, going to fit with the way that you feel about that experience? Same with the word victim, right? Um, and disclose as much or little as you want. Like, I think that that's the huge thing. It's placing the autonomy back in the hands of the person who's, who's had trauma. This is a choice. You don't owe anybody an explanation of what you've been through. And on top of that, empowering the person on the other side mm-hmm. to ask questions. Like you put right. it out there. Okay. They're, they may ask the clumsiest right. fucking question right. that, that comes yeah. to mind, but be yeah. prepared because you've put it out there. Yep. 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 And, and try to handle yourself and that other person with grace, right? This sure. could be the first time they're having this conversation. And so not everybody knows to keep their facial expressions in check. Um, sometimes mm. people have, um, you know, really intense responses and then they can walk back from that, right? Like leave a little space for that. And if you can't, like, that's where you are. Right. And that's, that's important to know as well. That's a great point. Okay. So that's the initial disclosure. The, the second scenario. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what I'm thinking here, right? You're in a relationship that's sort of like, I don't know, you're a year in, maybe two years in, a couple of years in, whatever. And something has happened, something's coming up that you didn't expect or realize was a trigger. Because mm. I think we need to talk about these situations because we talk about triggers as if we know all of our triggers ahead of time. And we know some of them, likely, especially if you've done some work in the space, but um, th- it's totally possible for you to have triggers that you don't know about. And so you're in this relationship, you feel this trusting bond, um, and then something happens 
and you're triggered and you're like, oh shit, now what? So Mm -hmm. this, the example that I thought of here was like, so let's say your, your partner is bothering you about working too much and you feel really triggered by this because a previous partner did this and it actually had negative consequences, both for your career and your relationship. And so you're, you're in this now place of like, okay, I know cognitively I'm in a new relationship. I know this isn't my past partner. They're doing something that reminds me of the past partner. I'm having an outsized reaction. This is going to cause conflict likely. This person doesn't necessarily even know that this was a thing, right? Because that's not necessarily something that would have come up when you're talking about past relationships. Now, what the hell do you do? Does that make sense as a, as like a possibility? It does. I mean, I, as somebody who has been married a very long time, you know, stuff doesn't start getting real until year three or four. Um, right. And certain things come up and, you know... I don't want to say it in a cavalier fashion, but the bloom does come off the bros and then you have to start intellectualizing Uh stuff. You have to start being like, okay, this is now now there is a cost benefit analysis of where I want to go with this, how I'm going to handle it. Yeah. Um, And oftentimes in marriage, it just leads to, you know, shitty suppression tactics and just, you know, jamming it down and not dealing with it. So, so please, yeah, Yeah. I I get it a hundred percent. Which we're going to talk about. (laughs) in a minute with a long-term relationship, because that's exactly kind of what I had in mind for that. But so I think here, um, the really important thing, here's the thing, we don't learn how to have conflict. This is not something that we teach in schools yet. This is not something that we figure out. And so I think when we are faced with something like this, we feel like we only have one choice, or actually we have two choices, right? We can stuff it down, as you mentioned, kind of, you know, sweep it under the rug, pretend like it didn't happen, go forward, carry some resentment, see how, how long we can carry that. Or we feel like the only other option is to blow up the relationship, right? Yeah. Oh, see, here's the sign. This person is exactly like this previous partner. This is exactly what I didn't want. Fuck this. We're done. Totally and binary. I think, it's a total binary totally. situation. Yeah. Okay. And there's so much, if we can walk into conflict, even if that relationship doesn't work out, Walking into conflict helps you figure out your way around conflict and relationship, which is a necessary tool for a long-term relationship. You can't have a long-term relationship that has any value without conflict. And if you don't know how to argue, that's a huge problem. So I think, so let's say you're in this situation, you notice like, so your partner is like, oh my gosh, get off the computer. It's 10 o'clock. Like, why are you still working? Um, and they might not even mean anything by it, but you're all of a sudden like your shoulders are going up and you're tensing. Um, take some space for a minute. Think about it. Try not to respond in the triggered space because we know we don't have access to the full um, spectrum of our of our rational brain when we're triggered. Um, and then circle back. Explain the backstory. Detail how the trigger happened and say something like, this involves you, but it's not about you, right? right? This is a really tricky thing for, for couples. Like, because we assume if I've triggered someone, I've done something bad. That's actually wrong in two ways. Number one, you can't possibly know their triggers. So it's not like you did this malicious thing. And number two, when you trigger someone, they have now an opportunity to work through something. Triggers are not things we should um, avoid. They're signs of something that needs to be integrated. So saying something like, you know, this is about you, but it doesn't come from you or like it, this involves you, but it's not your fault. And then explain in, in as rational a way as you possibly can. This is what went on in my last relationship. This is what it did. When you said that thing last night about, you know, me getting off my computer, I just was brought back to the past in a way that really surprised me. Can we figure out a way to communicate around work boundaries in a way that feels more comfortable to both of us. And then again, if you can, if you need to take some space, because it's likely that your partner is going to feel defensive. That's a natural thing. I didn't mean that. I didn't. That's not what I said. I'm not that person. How dare you, right? All these things come up. Can you pause and then again, circle back with some thoughts um, if your partner needs to process um, and then make a plan together about what comes next. 
I hate the language of like negotiation and relationships, but it's a negotiation, right? Just because you have a trigger doesn't mean that your partner doesn't get to have any boundaries or needs. And like those boundaries and needs don't trump over the fact that you had a trigger. It has to, you both have to come to the table and say, okay, here's, here's the negotiation. I would love it if you had a cutoff time of 1030, unless there's an emergency. Could you tell me that there's an emergency and you're going to need to work late so that I can make a plan for my evening? You know, um, whatever negotiation works for both of you. That's that brings to mind. I mean, my own personal experience had an incredibly gifted and wonderful, sweet therapist early on in our marriage who gave us the tools. And you may know the, you know, there may be a academic underpinning or in literature, but when you cannot articulate conflict Mm. at that moment, it breaks down to four things and you just, and my wife and I used it was you're either mad, glad, sad, or afraid. Yes. And there were times when my wife would say, I'm afraid right now. Mm-hmm. And it, it was sort of like a whistle being blown in everybody. Yeah. It's like, okay. Yeah. And, and that was, I'm mad right now. And mm-hmm. then it was also, you know, there were really good days where it was like, I'm really glad, you know, this is, I'm, yeah. I'm really happy with this, but just having that one word that was sort of this, you know, <laughs> this kind of a pistol crack that like, okay, yeah. We're going to leave this on the table and then we can come back with it. Um, it was yeah. a really useful tool. Yeah. I love that because I think, and I, I constantly think about this. Like when was the last time, if you hadn't, if you hadn't gotten that tool, when was the last time you said a sentence like that to another human being? I'm you afraid. Didn't, yeah. Right. Like, Yeah. You wouldn't, it would, it would be, you would try to expand on it. You would try to, you know, yeah. Having that one word was extremely valuable because instead Mm -hmm. I would have over explained, um, you know, tried to couch the situation, Mm -hmm. thrown the situation away, taken the heat myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but then on the receiving end, when your partner says, I'm afraid, oof, man, you, then you get defensive. Then you want to help. Then mm-hmm. it's like, what did I do? Mm-hmm. But having that tool explained going, this is just a starting point. Mm-hmm. Everybody calm down. Everybody take a breath. And then mm-hmm. we can, you know, form our thoughts after that. Mm-hmm. I also think, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of low stakes tools when you're, when, you know, relationship conflict is really terrifying. And so if you're not used to using this language around your partner, is there anyone in your life you can practice with, right? Where you have a text conversation or a conversation in real life and you just say, I'm mad, right? Not at them, not just at, about work. I'm glad I'm afraid of whatever. Cause I think we, we, the way that we do emotion in this culture is to manage it and, and assume that it's basically a solo activity. And so yeah. that makes this disclosure of I'm scared really uh, loaded on both sides, right? So you, as the person disclosing it, feel really intensely vulnerable. And as the person who's hearing it, feels like you've done something horrific, Right. When in reality, I think if we were more used to talking about this stuff, it would just be easier to say, hey, we had this conversation yesterday, Paul. I'm really glad about that. So we we are talking it's we're talking about really controlled situations and real sensible people in in moments where they can give time to expanding on this. But it goes to that conflict resolution of just I'll put it in one big lump sentence. God damn it. Why aren't you hearing me? Why aren't Mm -hmm. you holding space for me? What don't you realize what I've been through or what's brought me to this point? Mm -hmm. Defusing that situation. Mm -hmm. Where do you go from there? I, I mean, I think this is where, so I said kind of on purpose circle back twice because I think it's our most powerful relational tool. Um, because we can try to think about this. You can read about conflict. You can learn all these tools, but in the actual moment, when your prefrontal cortex goes offline, because you're so activated, you forget everything, 
right? And that's that's mm-hmm. the kind of human folly. Um, but I think if you have the relationship or you have the tool in your relationship of being able to circle back, then you can repair and correct the conversation, right? Don't assume that you're going to be perfect um, at conflict just because you know this one tool, right? Um, we're all going to have moments when we're so activated that we um, that we do things that we regret, that we say things, that we don't see each other, that we, um, you know, make it all about us, whatever. Um, but I think circling back when you are in a rational space, the other thing that's, and this tool is kind of like implicated in, in the circle back is the pause, whatever kind of attachment style, whatever your, your Enneagram, whatever your, your, your astrological sign, I don't care. We need to understand that a pause is almost always necessary in a conflict because when we are in that space of activation, nothing productive happens. Okay. And I think like people are like, oh, but I'm just someone who I have to have a fix right away. No. Right. When you're dealing with another human being, that's, that's, you you have to, this has to be a negotiation and the, the pause needs to be articulated, um, again, as a negotiation that both people are comfortable with. So how long is the pause? I need 30 minutes. I need to walk around the block. I need to talk about this tomorrow, right? Um, those, I think, these things are, are critical conflict tools that I wish I hadn't, you know, learned in high school. Yeah. And I think it comes back to it's not about me. You know, right. this person is processing. It's not about me. It's right. the, you, know, right. you may be the only person in the room when this came up, or you may be the catalyst, but right. don't mm-hmm. become self-absorbed that you can fix it or you're the core of the problem. Right, right, right. It's yeah. each person has their own path, their own past, their own needs. And that's, I think that has to be, that's a fact that has to be maintained. Um, so I think, as you just said, like reminding yourself, this is not about me, Right. When you're in that situation, like if you were saying to me, MC, you know, you were bugging me about work and I'm really triggered. My instant go-to as someone who talks about these tools all day, every day is to be like, what are you talking about, Paul? I didn't mean that. Right. I immediately get defensive. And so like, don't make it the goal that that's going to be your like instinct. It isn't. Yeah. But if, if in, in the course of an hour of us going back and forth about that, where you're trying to say how you felt, and I'm trying to say, I didn't mean it. Can I like somewhere in 60 minutes say, hold on, let me pause, you know? I just had a scenario. I know we were discussing the the stages within a relationship, but there's one that it just popped up was somebody who let's say they are 27 and they are yeah. a victim of violent crime. Mm-hmm. It changes their life. It changes the, the neuro neuroplasticity is, you know, <laughs> is different after the, mm-hmm. after this experience. What do they do at 28 years old, nine months, 12 months later, when think we're feeling good, think we're doing that mm-hmm. well, they're in the process of healing but yet we still need to live. We still need to have connection and still date. Um, we were talking about people with legacy trauma and things that have happened in the past that we've mm-hmm. built into our core, but fresh stuff and then still integrating real life. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you, you said it in the question, which is <clears throat> neuroplasticity. So we're actually using this um this word malleability now instead of neuroplasticity because plasticity kind of suggests that you have if you imagine a plastic and you melt it and it reforms into a, another kind of shape um they're kind of realizing that that that's not the best way to think about the brain because what's actually happening is that our brain is changing all the time throughout our whole life and so I think the first step is to understand that your your brain and your nervous system are malleable. So yeah. whatever happened is not fixed, even though it may feel like it at the moment. Like that's not like rendered somewhere forever in, in a particular way that's going to result in a certain behavior. Um, and I think that's the first step. The second step is giving yourself and the people around you grace with that. 
right? We live in a culture that is so afraid of trauma that when I go give a corporate presentation, they don't want me to say the T word, right? Really? Because they're afraid of what's going to come up in the, in the employment space. And so like, I think we, and we're also bad at this understanding that trauma impacts not just the person that went through it, but also it kind of reverberates through their whole, whoever else is in their life right? Friends, family are also impacted. And so that all needs to kind of be taken into account. Um, and everyone I think needs to be given grace to do that integrating work, which happens over time and step by step. What kinds of safety can you bring in? What kinds of like feelings of empowerment can you bring in on a daily basis that can help sort of um, continue to shape your brain? Does that make sense? It does, especially the thing about it being malleable, because mm -hmm. you're you, you, with that malleability, you can go three steps forward and you're healing and two steps yeah. back. It's mm -hmm. it's it's ebb and flow. And totally. yeah. and I think that that's one of the. You know, not putting my journey into it, it was not a single line of trending mm -hmm. success to get to a point of healing. Yeah. Yeah. There were there were some epic shit shows in between and falling back and forth and feeling like it was never going to change. Yeah. And to have somebody holding an environment and that that it was okay, that that mm -hmm. failure is is baked into this. Yeah. And so yeah. that that requires malleability. Yeah. Totally. Did you yeah. and this is after a violent crime? No, it was, uh, it was after, um, suicide, uh, suicide attempts and, mm -hmm. you know, when, and everything else. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then what was so interesting about that experience was that the people that, uh, the friends are close to it, you know, me are like, yeah. wow, I, I'm so glad you made it to the other side, but I don't know how life is going to be the same after this for you. Mm -hmm. You might as well just rewrite the script. And I was like, that, that was, that was bracing. Yeah. Was that, did you feel like that was like a, was that a welcome truth or were you like, thanks, that's not helpful. It was, it was a little, a little from column A, a little from column B. I mean, I, you know, you knew the reality, right? but it was the, no, I, I want to see if I can fix this. I want to see yeah. if I can make everything better and I'm going to step up to the challenge and then somebody going, mm, you know, I, I've looked at the odds. They're not that good. Um, yeah. was a, was a weird, was a weird space to be. Um, yeah. 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 Not, not super yeah. affirming. Yeah. We do. I think, you know, we do a terrible job at so many things in the space of trauma and grief, but I think, you know, suicidality and suicide attempts, it's the, the very worst, right? Like being yeah. able to even talk about that and have people not have an immediate, like, Oh, you know, like, stop, hold on. You can't, we can't talk about this. It's so ultra taboo. I didn't know what was going to be harder for, you know, we talked about this year for me. I thought me coming out as a bisexual male was going to be mm -hmm. the hardest. Mm -hmm. What was actually hardest was me openly discussing suicide ideation and me dancing with that dark side because, and then I thought about it, I can't do anything about my sexual identity. That's me. I was born with that. Accept it, move on, embrace it, celebrate it, move on. Mm -hmm. But in our culture, yeah, you, you could have been a little bit tougher. You didn't have, you know, you didn't have to go to Susie. You could have, you know, you could have sucked it up. You could have, you know, and that's the way the brain works. It's like, oh, one is an option, one isn't. And I took the weaker option and then the shame and then boom, 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 boom. You start rolling down the hill. And I think that that in a relationship, that's why you don't want to disclose it because somebody will be like, well, that's a personal choice. You know, that that's your failing. That's your weakness. Yeah. I think that that's the space that reveals the, the deep necessity for us to start talking about the parallels between physical illness and mental illness, right? Mm -hmm. Suicidal ideation is mental illness. That is a real thing that you did not cause. You cannot control. You didn't choose it, right? And temporary and, because it's, temporary. it's you're, you're branded. I mean, I know you work with um, 
you know, people in the federal penitentiary system, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people getting out of prison right. have right. done their time. Right. They are right. still seen as offenders, as criminals, right. as that, even though they've done what has been asked of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it is a, I may be speaking in a very cogent manner, but it will always be a fear of mine that somebody now knows this information about me. And it was like, yeah, God, it's too bad. You know, it'd, it'd be cool, you know, if he was whole. Yeah. 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 Deep dark. Yeah. Because That's right. if you had had, you know, cancer and beat it, nobody be celebrated. would you'd be celebrated. Everyone would be yeah. doing a victory lap. Oh, you're such a hero. Yeah. Right? We actually use the language of like, you know, you're a hero. You beat it. And, but the most affirming thing is people sharing quietly. Right. Like, oh, right. I'm so glad you told your story. It was so inspiring. Yeah. You know, in, you know, in, in a corner, you know, of the party. Hey, right. can I talk to you for a minute? It's not like, woo, hey, look at you. No, it's like, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? I want to share something. That's, it's wonderful to, to now have that out there, but to have those two examples that you brought up be so... And that is what we are afraid of constantly yeah. in engaging in relationships, especially now in the third one that we talk about is the long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. There may already be fractures unrelated to your trauma. And it's like, exactly. shit, am I going right. to, you know, is this going to be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back? Right. Right. And how, and I, yeah, that's a beautiful segue. So in a long-term relationship, so now in the third phase, so let's say something happened early in the relationship. And you swept it under the rug, as we talked about, as we are often do. That's what we're taught to do with, with big things like this. You know, conflict is bad. So sweep it under the rug and move on. And we, we get tricked into believing that we're okay, right? Because like things, sure. you know, life marches along. The relationship continues. You have good moments. So you're like, that's fine. I don't need to talk about that. We don't need to circle back. It's gone. It was 10 years ago until it pops up because the stuff waits for you right? Like it doesn't, it, does. it doesn't just go away. If you don't integrate it, it just waits. And so, um, you know, what do you do when you're in a long-term relationship? You're in year 15, you're in year 20, you have now shared property. Maybe you have children. There are like, you know, legal bonds between you. The stakes are higher. Yeah. What now what? Cause I think on the first date you can say, well, see you later. I'm out. Right. But in year 20, that's a, a lot harder. Yeah, that was an interesting question that I just had on my podcast with um, Rena Martin talking about ethical non-monogamy. I go, that's probably an easier thing to slide in at the beginning of the conversation than retrofit a long-term relationship and say, hey, let's give this a shot. Right. Um, and, in, and with that said, oftentimes the trauma in long-term relationships is infidelity. If it happens right. early on and then you move yeah. past it and it's like, okay, we've moved past it. We're, you know, right. everything's good. And then that will erupt. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's a great example. And I think, you know, the thing here, and I'm, I'm, I'm not often this prescriptive about this, but go to therapy. Yeah. And, and I think here, here's why since this happened, like in the relationship, the likelihood that even one of you is going to be able to get enough external perspective to get an objective view on it is slim to none. And you really need both parties to be able to get to that space. So without a third party, without a coach or a therapist, that's going to be pretty impossible. Um, even if you're both therapists, right? Like we just have blind Which spots. is probably we even more, ham which is even worse. Totally, right. You're just Doctor heal thyself. No, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, going, like recognizing it, bringing to the table, I think we need to be a lot less scared of couples counseling as, as a culture because we have this assumption that if you go to couples counseling, it's because you're in trouble, but I think it can be an incredible growth opportunity. Um, and, you know, bringing this to the table with someone who's an expert and can help you sort through and see what your blind spots are and help you kind of figure out how to move forward. Um, because there's going to be work on both sides of the equation, no matter what the equation looked like. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you have infidelity that happened, you know, 10 years ago and it's coming up because the partner who was betrayed is kind of still bringing that up into conflict or into conversation or they're feeling triggered by something, they have work to do. 
And nobody wants to hear that or say that because the person who's been betrayed, you know, they, they, they assume that there's no work. How could there be work? I didn't do this. Right. Well, continuing the relationship you signed up for now, this is something you have to integrate as well. And that sucks. Like, I'm not saying that, like, you know, I'm not trying to say that lightly, but a therapist will be able to say, okay, here's your work, person A, here's your work, person B, this is what the structure is going to look like. Let's come back together and work out whatever else comes up, you know? I've always thought marriage vows should be changed to sickness and mental health. <laughs> Cause it's like, let's put that on the table. Cause it's not all about the body going bad. It's about right. pro- most of the time it's the brain having right. some issues over the years. So right. yeah, mental health is going to be the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. And being afraid of, of bringing that in again, like draw the parallel, right? If you started having like some mysterious pain in your shoulder or something, your wife would say like, look, Paul, like you got to go to the doctor. And if yeah. you refused, now you're doing something to the relationship. It's not just mm-hmm. about you. And so it's like, you know, we've, we've got to be able to draw the parallel and say, if, if, I, if something's coming up for me and I'm being triggered, I have to then be willing to go to therapy and you have to be willing to go to therapy and therapy is not a scary place. Um, yeah. And this is going to be, if we have a chance to move forward without resentment, it's most likely going to happen in that realm. That's so funny. That's a great example. I mean, how many of us have the, the cliche of the henpecked husband whose yeah. wife is watching his diet, you know, for his right. cholesterol or his diabetes, right. you know, that's, that's her job. <laughs> that's what she does, you know, but nobody's ever doing, have you done self care? Have you seen your therapist? Have you done this? You need to come on, be good to yourself. That is not a dialogue that is had in most marriages. Oh. Yeah. Or, or, Hey, I'm noticing you have no, you know, energy, your passion is gone. You used to laugh. Like yeah. these are things that our, our, our intimate partners will see and recognize from the outside much, much more quickly than anybody else. Why, why can't we treat these as real valid issues that we should go, you know, check out? Yeah. Well, oh, that's great. Okay. So taking it all the way back and with John's book, single on purpose, where he, Actually, the mission of that book is that when you're single, there's no better period for growth and expansion Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. being your best self. Mm -hmm. Do you have to get your trauma and handling that all under control before you set out? Should you? No. Okay. (laughs) Are you surprised by that answer? No, I'm not. I just, I wanted to see how emphatic that answer was because I, I, I agree. I mean, that's, that's, that's ludicrous to make that demand on somebody. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also just it, that, that when, when we talk that way, we have the wrong frame on what healing actually looks like, right? We do a little bit of healing alone. We do healing with other people, right? The most powerful healing happens in relationship. And so um, you can, you can listen, take space if you want to and work on yourself. Like, I'm not saying don't do that, but don't have this like limitation on yourself that, you have to sort out all your trauma, figure out all your triggers, be like healed, right? Before you get into, before you have the audacity to get into a relationship. That's just not what happens. And I've seen this, like I have seen clients take, you know, two or four years off of dating and they go into this like cave of self-discovery um, and they're, they do a lot of growth. They do a lot of reading. They do a lot of research. They do a lot of work. And then they go into the world and all of, with the assumption that now they've done the work, right? Um, yeah. And they interface with another human being and everything falls apart or it feels like it falls apart because they're not this like well-honed, cured machine, right? That's not how this works. When you're face-to-face with another human being, stuff comes up that couldn't possibly when you're alone reading a book. Yeah. So work on what you need to work on to feel comfortable interfacing with other human beings. Right. And then give yourself some grace and, and also the acknowledgement and knowledge that when stuff comes up in a relationship, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you, the other person or the relationship. It just means stuff is coming up. Can you think of that as an opportunity to heal yourself, the other person, the relationship, instead of this like damning statement of your worth? And so the takeaway is that, that your healing should be holistic. 
It should not yes. be not should not be monastic, like you said, yes. going yes. away and all that stuff. Yes. It should be holistic. Yeah. 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 Well, you're still and, and interacting. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. We integrate forever. Our, our little brains and our little memory, you know, the hippocampus, was, which is in charge of our long-term memory, is refiling stuff all the time. So, like, this idea that we, like, integrate something and then, like, check a box and we're done is, it, that's not the, that's not how that works. That's biologically impossible. Well, I think that's a great place to put a cap on it. Yeah. Thanks, MC. Thank you, Paul. This was lovely, as always. MC, where can everybody find you? I am on Instagram at MC, PhD, E M S E Y, PhD. Um, and I have uh, my website is alchemycoaching.life. How about you? Um, everybody can find every, everything to know about me on smartfunnytortured.com. And that's the same for my Instagram handle. Awesome. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. I hope that episode was helpful. Hey, listen, if you want to share your singlehood journey, if you've gone somewhere, come back. If you have revelations and wisdom, please share your story. It's going to help other people. Nothing makes us feel more connected than hearing other people's stories. So just send me the audio of your story and you could just record it directly from your phone and email it to theangrytherapist at gmail.com. Also, if you want our Single on Purpose newsletter, go to singleonpurpose.life. That's singleonpurpose.life. You will get tools and articles and other people's stories and also uh, Zoom links to private gathers. So if you want to join our community, go to singleonpurpose.life. Thank you for listening. Be well. We hope you tell a friend. I am currently 36 years old. I met my now ex-husband when I was 17 years old. Uh, we got married when I was 30 and were married for about a year and a half until one Tuesday night he decided he'd had enough. I um, quickly spiraled into a deep black, black hole, um, could barely function um, and even had one night in hospital after an OD. Then one day I decided to make a change and I decided to go traveling, um, which was something I'd always wanted to do, but being in a relationship and, and being too afraid to be on my own, um, this experience it, traveling on my own um, completely transformed my life um, and my relationship with myself and and the world, really. Um, so here are the top 10 lessons I learned um, during that experience. Number one, yes, that was shit, but what are you going to do about it? In other words, you always have a choice about how you're going to respond to something. Number two, yes, it's hard, but not doing it is harder. Change is hard, but ignoring the fact you need to make a change in your life will only make life harder in the long run. Number three, the world is full of so many good people. You only need to spend a few minutes, have a genuine conversation with someone to see that. Number four, fear is pretty much bullshitting us all day. Number five, it's okay to be lost and have no idea what you're doing. You just have to try. Number six, trust yourself. Number seven, then trust the universe. Number eight, let go of the delusion of control. Number nine, you are guacamole, so don't let anyone ever treat you like free salsa. And number 10, forgive yourself.